Our scripture reading for today is John chapter 13, 31 through 38, where it says, When he, that is Judas, was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Well, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I have to pray for your blessing, your spirit to be in what is shared here today. I thank you for helping me prepare, but really, Lord, let it be all about you and let the messenger disappear. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, famous last words. And this is just the beginning. We are entering into a long passage in which Jesus speaks to his disciples the most important things they need to hear before he is taken from them. And it's hard to break this up over the next several weeks, but we have to. One thing you could do to keep hold of the bigger picture we will be examining in pieces is to read for yourselves all of John from chapter 13 through 17. Maybe do that once a week. Those five chapters all cover the one conversation and prayer that Jesus had with his disciples at the Last Supper and just before his arrest. John took good notes. And of course, the Holy Spirit helped him remember. Now as you read, ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand and to receive insight into its meaning. And then maybe you'll have something to share too. That's really the way it's supposed to be. Not just me lecturing you, but you reading the word for yourselves and learning from it as the Spirit leads and sharing as you learn. There are five important moments to notice in the passage we're looking at today. I'm going to just list them and then we'll go back over them. First, Jesus announced his glorification had begun because Judas was on his way to have Jesus arrested. Second, Jesus helped his disciples prepare for coming events by telling them ahead of time that he would be taken from them for a while. They can't go with him. And so this is the third moment. He commands them to love one another so that the world will know that they are his disciples. Love lights the way. And that probably is the most important line in this text and we'll be paying more attention to it later. But what I want to show you here is the fourth important moment. And that is that Peter didn't pay any attention to Jesus' command. He was still thinking about what Jesus said just before that. He was focused on where and why Jesus was leaving. And like a kid who wants to be with his parents, his attitude sounded like, why can't I come? I'll stay with you no matter what. And that leads to the fifth moment, the prediction of Peter's denial. Let's take a closer look at each of these. Back to the first one. The announcement that Jesus was being glorified. We've talked before about how Jesus proved his sovereignty over all circumstances by being able to tell his disciples what was going to happen before it happened so that when it happened, they would be better able to believe in him. And I want you to note that predicting Peter's denial was part of that. But let's look at what he said first. He was telling them, this is the end of the road for a while. 
Things were not going to turn out the way they wanted them to. Jesus was not the Messiah they were thinking about, expecting and hoping for. He was not going to raise an army, not lead a political rebellion and conquer Rome, not even kick Rome out of Israel. He would be a better and greater Messiah than that, but they could not have understood it at this point. Jesus did announce that now he was being glorified. And in their minds, that would have meant coronation and sitting on the throne of King David. Jesus did not deny that he would end up there. He also did not give any details this time about the path he must take to get there. In the months and weeks before, he had told them plenty of times that the Son of Man must be handed over and be crucified. But this time he just said that he was going where they could not follow. And when Jesus spoke of his glorification, it meant he was going to be glorified in a completely different way than what was on their minds. It was something they never imagined could be glorious. They would really have no way of seeing Jesus on the cross as anything other than gory. Certainly not glory. They would not see the glory in it until after the resurrection. But for now, it would have been too much for them to bear and would have required a much longer conversation than Jesus had time for. Now it does follow logically from that for Jesus to give that famous command. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The logic is this. Jesus was saying, in other words, since I will not be with you who love me, I'm asking you to love one another for me and in the same way that I have loved you. The importance of this is so that all who see you, come on. The importance of this is so that all who see you will remember that you learned it from me. And that is another way that I will be glorified among you and before you. But Peter skipped over that. So we will too for now because it will be much better for us to end on that great command. This is the fourth moment. Peter was still back on Jesus' statement, where I am going, you cannot come. He stopped listening to anything else after that moment as he thought about that and quickly came up with an important question. Lord, where are you going? Jesus accepted this interruption in his train of thought and very patiently replied, where I am going you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter did not accept that. He just had to ask, Lord, why can't I follow you? I will lay down my life for you. And again, very patiently, Jesus answered Peter's question. He started out by asking Peter a question. Will you really lay down your life for me? But he did not wait for Peter to answer. We all know what Peter would have said. Yeah! But Jesus knows more about Peter than Peter does. All we have left are the words on paper. How I wish we could hear the way Jesus said those words. I wish we could have seen the expression on Jesus' face as he spoke to Peter. But I think we would have seen concern there and compassion in his voice. Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. To me, when Jesus said Peter can't follow Jesus, it didn't mean he wasn't allowed. It meant that Jesus knew that Peter was not able he didn't have the strength or the courage to keep his promise to stand by Jesus no matter what. Not yet, anyway. Now, to be fair, neither did any of the other apostles. That's why Jesus started out saying to all of them, where I am going, you, that's plural you, all of you, cannot come. You're just not strong enough yet. But since Peter was the one who outspokenly declared his allegiance, it was only fitting that Jesus would speak to him about his particular way of failing. In Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel, Peter responds again by saying, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. 
In those Gospels, Peter denies that he will deny Jesus. <laughs> John, however, skipped over that to focus his attention on what Jesus was saying. That important spiritual conversation that takes up all the chapters through 17 in his Gospel. Before we leave this point, look at how specific it is. The sign of the rooster's crow meant that this very night, before the dawn, within six or seven hours, Peter would deny that he knew Jesus. Not once and not in general, but specifically three times, according to Jesus. Now, Peter knew that Jesus never lied. He knew that Jesus was never wrong. But how he must have struggled with that. Peter had a lot to think about. I would not be surprised if he started repeating over and over to himself some kind of resolute determination to make sure he did not deny Jesus this night of all nights. Now remember this when we get to that section of John 18 where we watch Peter try to defend Jesus at first and end up fulfilling this prophecy that Jesus gave much to his dismay. So now let's go back to that command that Peter skipped. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Is this really a new command? Didn't Jesus already point out earlier that the greatest command is to love God and love one's neighbor as themselves with all their heart and soul and strength? So what is new? about this command to love. Perhaps it is that this time the emphasis is on one another. Jesus wants a special bond of love to develop between the believers. Loving God is of course tantamount. Loving neighbors is actually not that hard when it comes to being kind and helping people out. But loving each other? <laughs> well you know there's a song that bears out an important truth you always hurt the one you love. I myself should be embarrassed to admit that I have often expressed more anger with my closest relatives than with anyone else. The only reason I'm not embarrassed to candidly admit that to you is that I'm pretty sure you've done the same in your families. I sometimes pray that I will love my neighbors as much as I love my own family and also that I will be as nice to my family members as I am to everyone else because that's love. And when it comes to the disciples, think about the situation they were in after the next few hours with Jesus arrested, tortured, and dead on a cross. By Saturday morning or afternoon, they were all ashamed of themselves. They were all suffering terribly as they grieved the loss of their beloved leader, and they have all failed to live up to their promises to die with him. Earlier they had argued about which of them was the greatest. It was only natural that in these moments, as they tried to figure out what happened, they would end up blaming each other and trying to figure out which of them was the worst. Often pointing the accusing finger is an effort to avoid being the accused. But Jesus had told them ahead of time to love one another. That would be the remedy and the glue that would hold them together until Resurrection Sunday and it would also be what holds the whole church together for all time. Notice that Jesus did not say that by such love people would know that they were his disciples. They are Jesus' disciples. They would still be Jesus' disciples after the resurrection. The tense of that little word was a key to the point that Jesus' death was not the end of their discipleship. It was a sign that he would rise again and live forever so that forever and always those who follow Jesus are his disciples. Love lights the way. Love lights the way through the darkness of sin and shame and leads us to the Savior. Love lights the way through the shadows of persecution and death and keeps the hope of the church alive and burning in the hearts of the saints. This command to love one another is that important, and yet we have often failed. That's why I'm wearing this t-shirt that reads, 
It says, anybody can love the ideal church. We all have an idea in our minds about what church is supposed to be like. The challenge is to love the real church. And uh, I almost didn't wear this t-shirt today because, you know, too casual. But then I decided that if I do and some of you don't like it, that gives you a chance to love me anyway. <laughs> God would have preferred for his body to remain united in loving harmony. And yet over the years, splits have happened. Now we have more than, I had to look this up, there's more than 30,000 Christian denominations all over the world with at least 200 distinct flavors just in the United States. And I think there are 10 different ones just in Lake City that I consider to be all authentically Bible-believing Christians our differences arose during disputes in the past over matters about theology and church governance. It is distressing to me that humans apparently forgot to ask the Holy Spirit to help for reconciliation so that conflicts could have been resolved peacefully and harmony restored. There have been periods of church history in which denominations fought literal wars killing each other physically in the effort to hold on to what each thought was best and really from God and punish those heretics. But such division is the devil's work. I believe that every church split and every denomination started with a sinfully unreconciled conflict. One or both combatants failed to love the other. It's a sad historical reality. And it may be just as well that these distinct congregations maintain their unique identities now that we are where we are. You could say that by having many buildings and many doorways through which seekers might enter the church, the net has been spread wide by having many denominations. But I think we could have come up with that without fighting. I really believe that Jesus' command that we should love one another has a special application today to the various congregations. In the essentials, we're all already united by our common faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, our only hope for salvation. On that basis, we really ought to enjoy each other's company more often and more fully. To accomplish that, we all have to believe and live according to the motto we share with many other denominations who see the beauty of it. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Charity is the same as love. We can love one another as we are united in the essentials of the faith. We can love one another as we allow liberty for differences in the non-essentials. And that is how we can love one another in all things. This would fulfill Jesus' command to us in our text today. I am grateful that more and more pastors also desire the fellowship of peaceful harmony united by the Holy Spirit. The ordinary citizens, members of the congregations, and even the unchurched people, I have heard them talk about it, all believe that we ought not to be in competition with each other. They want to see actualized what Jesus commanded. By this, all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. I think we are at a point in history where most of us want to recover that beautiful harmony. And so, disciples of Christ, my fellow believers, let us love one another and work together with grace and peace in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And may sinners and seekers find and see that this fellowship is a place where grace, mercy, and peace prevail. We want all to know that they will also be loved. That this is a place to receive the forgiveness we all so desperately need in the love of Christ. And so now, as we prepare to receive communion, let us reflect on the fact that this simple meal represents Jesus' most profound act of love in that it signifies his body and blood given for us so that we can be forgiven of sin by his sacrifice on the cross. It is also often pointed out that when we share one loaf of bread, 
It is because there is only one body to which we belong, the body of Christ, the true bread. So let us pray. I do thank you, Lord, for where we are in history. Religious wars are centuries ago. Denominational differences are smoothing out. The conflicts are still difficult, and the essentials are still being sorted out and maybe even debated. But those who are truly in Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit recognize each other and love each other no matter what congregation they've come from and all of us desire that unity to grow and develop and we pray Lord that we will see it more and more to bring glory and honor to your name as we love one another we ask it in Jesus name